All right. So let's, uh, first of all, any questions about uh, the things that we have done last time? Any questions about what we covered last time? Any, co any questions? Uh, number two, um, let me see. I think it was here, but I could turn that off. That's better. So I'm going to quickly go through the, uh, the last things we talked about, kind of do a quick, rev a quick review on it, um, and then we'll continue with the rest of the stuff. Uh, those people who need extension with their work, um, um, I will, I think, I don't know if I posted for OOP345 or not, the format that you asked for extension. You give me the, the submissions, the, the submission commands, the name of the workshop. So you're going to put exactly what is the name of the workshop, what you submit. You put that one, you put number of days and why. It doesn't have to be any reason that, I, I just, I'm just interested to know why. Like you can say, because I couldn't read from the file, because um, the move constructor didn't work, because this and that, and I have no problem giving extensions, okay? So extensions you can get, something like that. So what you say, I have memory leak, I have to fix the problem, I need three days. So you mentioned number of days, exact name. So I don't want to look for the workshop. I just want to copy what you put, paste it in a, in a, in a submitter config file so the extension is done easily. I want it to be done quickly. So um, let me just, maybe I can make it even easier if I did it this way. Give me a second. Meanwhile, I can pause. Do not use, lose, use output, Outlook and email for your communication with me. Please always send your messages as private, if it's private, as private chats over here. See, I have 12 over here, so I can actually go and take a look qu quickly. The amount of email is so much that you do that, then it's gonna get shuffled between hundreds of other emails, and I'm gonna reply to you when you graduate it, so you don't want that. So. Um, Put it over here, then I can go and quickly answer the questions that you have. Um, uh, and also, let me just put these over here as an announcement. And I'm gonna say over here, requesting for uh, extension. So if you wanna request for extension, this is what you do. You submit your request for extension through a private message on Microsoft Teams as follows. Send your request containing following information. Reason. Now, what is the reason? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Okay? I just, I'm just interested. Like, you were sick, you, you couldn't do it, or you had problem with specific topics, so it's a feedback to me to see what students have problem in. Then workshop submission name and number of days. There you go. So, so in your case, it's got to be something like, I think, 345W3. P2, right? Something like that. That's the format of yours. And then how many days? Um, and yeah, so your, your request could be something like this. So what I'm going to do is simply copy this name and go to my configuration in, in Submitter, and I'm just going to put that one with the number of days you want. And it's, it's not the number of days from now. So number of days, I have to, uh, number of days since the due date, okay? So you have to tell me how much I should extend the due date. So if it's already, usually I don't accept extensions after due date, okay? So if you're like, but in the rare cases, if it happens, whatever it is, so you just look at what is a due date, and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to be able to do this by, by, by Tuesday, and you're going to count the days, and you give me that number. And it's going to be added, and, and that's how it's going to happen. So please request your extensions as follows. Send it to me as a private message. If I don't get to it on time, then I will, your two days, I'm going to make it four days to make sure that you actually get it. All right? That's that. Uh, questions on that? Suggestions, suggestions, objections, they're okay, all right. So 
So hopefully by next week, we're gonna go back to our normal lab schedule as being a lab, not a lecture, when we actually catch up. So today, I'm going to, today and the next day you're coming for your uh, lecture online. I'm gonna catch up with uh, the, 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 the weekly schedule and then after that, labs are gonna go to normal routines where uh, we could actually work on labs together. Pardon me? The what? The recordings. Oh, the recordings. So, do you know where my notes are on GitHub? Let me see if I'm making a mistake. Maybe I didn't put something over there, and I'm. So you go to the the uh, three, four, five organization, and over there is gonna say. OP345 NCC notes. And when you scroll down over there, it says recordings of preview lectures. And they're all there. All right? Everything's gonna be here. Anything that I want you to know and, and talk, it's gonna be there. <clears throat> and again, remember, cre uh, if you haven't created your uh, private repository and added me as a collaborator, do it, because when it times, time comes, and it will come, and you need help, that's how I help you. All right. Yes. So like you mentioned, I asked you Oh, because it's a private chat, you have to tell me I know, I know. what is the subject. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Like it's, it's a private chat, you have to say I'm in 345. When you give me the extension request, because the name of the workshop is there, then I know you're 345. You follow? So if you do it in a proper format, then I don't know. And if you need help to talk to me about, you're gonna say, I have a problem, this is my repository path, see if you can find out uh, what time, and, I'm gonna, and, and you give me your availability time, as if you want to just ha get an appointment with anyone. Uh, if it is during the office hours, you know that I'm activating that thing, you got, you got an invitation for it, I activated, I'm obviously online, we talk. But if I'm not at that time, any other time that we go, uh, we can talk. Okay, so like I can, uh, for extension, now you can do it, yeah. Even if it's for the previous one, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But from now on, please do your extensions uh, before the due date. Okay. It shows that you're working on it before. You know, we just didn't go beer drinking and partying and say, oh, the workshop's over, don't make me ask for it. Okay, so um, I, I need you to see that you, you have a problem doing it before workshop. Uh, so we talked about um, the reason that we need the, like I, I gave you uh, some examples of why do we need auto, and I gave you over there um, a class that I created to trace, so to debug your uh, applications if you wanna uh, have some kind of a class to show messages and stuff like that, be able to turn it on and off easily. There are so many different methods, that, but that just came good for an example. So this traceful thingy that I've created over here is, is an anom anonymous class. It's a class that has only one instance. It doesn't have a name, as you see, but I'm instantiating it right over here as tracer. So, and if I wanted to, I can actually make this an external one and put it in a header file so everybody can access it, but uh, it is what it is now. This tracer instance of mine's job is to like see out print stuff. So I overloaded the, the insertion operator several times for different things, whatever I want to print. I put it in here, and, like, and you can always add methods to it based on what you are debugging. If you are debugging, uh, I don't know, a, a queue, you can actually create a, an insertion operator for queue so to show a queue or a, I don't know, container or a class or whatever you have. Uh, but the problem over here was that because I want it to be cascaded, which means I want to be able my tracer to go back to back, something like tracer, create value like that, so I want to have these things happening back to back, I need to return the reference of the class that is owner, okay? And uh, because of that fact, I don't have, ha have a name, so that's why I tell to uh, C++ uh, the auto reference, which means from this it understands what is the reference and it creates it and therefore it, the type is returned. So auto is perfect for this. And later on, as I mentioned, you will see that we, we're gonna have 
types that are this long and you don't want to keep retyping it, you abbreviate them with type def in those scenarios. And if you want to recreate something that just sets stuff, you can use auto to uh, not to type over and over things that are uh, too long. And at the end, we're gonna have some kind of templates and uh, templates return different types. You don't know what the type that is returning, therefore you use auto. So for that template, automatically you're gonna get the value that you want. Another thing that I forgot to mention, when you are online, I can't see you, your microphone is off, so if you talk, no problem. When you come in person, when I talk, you don't, okay? It's very important. It's not because it's rude or I don't want to do this. If, if I could stand it, I would do it, but I easily get distracted. I mean like distracted to the bone, okay? And I will forget that I wanted, what I wanted to say. So if you have a question, a concern about what, the, what I'm talking about, stop me. Because if you have a concern with something that I'm telling you, believe me, half of the class has the same concern and they're not saying anything. Okay, so um, make sure you, do, you, you actually stop me instead of asking the question, what did he say? You can ask me, what did you say? And I'm gonna repeat it for you, okay? <laughs> of course you can. Uh, yes. To help me for debugging. So if you have C out, you are using C out for your program, you cannot use it. Of course, there are other objects. You can use C log, you can use C error, C E R R, and then uh, disable them, set their status to fail to inactive or activate them. But because I didn't want to do that, I didn't want to use the other console objects, I created my own to be able to debug my application. No, I didn't want to have instances of it. It doesn't make sense. It's like C out. You don't want C out to be have five different objects of it. It's, it. It is supposed to be only one object. Therefore, I didn't want to name it. I want it to be only unique, one thing out of it. I, don't, I didn't want the second one to get created out of it. Okay? Obviously, what you, <coughs> what you can do with this is to actually uh, forget about it. Okay, I don't want to, because if I want to talk about it, then I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep talking about it and it's going to go till forever. The only reason for this is to give you some legit valid reason to use auto. Okay, that's all. <laughs> all right. Uh, question down to here. All right. Um, next thing, uh, uh, I created uh, a C string uh, that does, uh, and I explained why uh, static functions uh, are used, and we said static functions, they belong to the class. We call the class methods, not object methods. They are not, uh, they are accessible by objects, of course, because objects are type of their class. But you don't need to instantiate C string to use the static methods because the methods belong to the class. And you have to remember, because of this uniqueness, uh, the static methods have no way to access normal methods or uh, normal properties of a class because you have five objects, so the normal properties and normal uh, methods of the class are recreated for every instance. But the static method is unique between all of them. If you want to refer to one, it becomes one to many relation. It doesn't know which one to go to, therefore you cannot call. You can call from a normal, uh, uh, within a normal method, you can call a static method. There is no problem. But the other way, it's impossible. Okay? It's like I am standing over here with five students in front of me. Any of those students can tell me, come forward, and I will come forward. But if I tell to those five students, come forward, which one is going to come? It's impossible. One to many relationship is one way. You cannot go back. Okay? Going back has no specific target. Therefore, static methods can only access static uh, 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 member variables, only static uh, attributes. And static, uh, static attributes and static methods uh, are uh, called also class variables and class functions, or class, class um, uh, yeah, class functions. Yes?
C++ tries to make everything type safe, okay? Constant, um, constant expression happens at compile time. So it literally, it doesn't interpret it at runtime. That's the difference. It's more efficient, okay? New version of it, let's put it that way. Okay, anything that you, you think, and some of these things are so, some of the concepts that you're gonna learn soon are so uh, rich for our blood, okay, that we should trust it because it's a new version we are using it. So whenever you have a question like that, of course, ask and I'll try to explain, but if you see it, there is a newer version, try to use that one because it's safer. It's the whole reason that C++ is improving like this and uh, the, the pure and old fashioned type of language is getting so much towards type specific language and you have to exactly define what is what is that uh, all the community, everybody always said that C++ is so powerful, the problem is that it's unsafe. You can shoot yourself in the foot very easily. Um, they try to make it safer and safer as they go forward, okay? But the engine underneath is the same power, so. Uh, yeah, so, and this one was just a dynamic reallocation, so just to remind you from OP244 when you're resizing how you do it, so it just uh, reads the stuff from thing. Please walk through it if you have any questions, come back to me. Then we created a name class in OP244 style and we put the rule, uh, uh, we followed rule of three, which was a cons copy constructor, copy assignment, a uh, copy instructor, copy assignment, and a destructor to make sure that there is no memory leak. But now that we are in OOP345, uh, uh, we learned that we could actually make the action of copying and uh, assigning more efficient by uh, not duplicating data when it's not needed. So at any moment that the, you feel the data is not needed, you don't need to keep the data. When you're copying one object to another, the original value is not needed and you can throw it away. Instead of copying it, you take ownership of it. It's very simple concept and it's much easier than copy construction, even in coding. Because in coding, you have to measure the thing, see what is the size, duplicate it, copy it. In here, you're simply gonna say, okay, give that to me, and you have nothing now, done, okay? And the process is like that, and it helps uh, uh, accelerating your program's uh, execution dramatically. So how, we, how it works, we are using the, uh, the double reference thingy, which is essentially, uh, is, is, uh, trying to move or either uh, enforce to be moved by putting it in, inside the move, com uh, move uh, statement. So if you say move something, uh, it will move it instead of copying it. Or if the object is about to die, it will do it automatically. You don't need to worry about it, okay? So if the object is nameless, it will actually move it. If it's not, you have to manually tell it to move. And that's why we over here put the move to make sure that no matter what type of reference coming into a move reference, it is assigned as move. That's why it's actually written as move over here and not only end. So, uh, yeah. So, um, and the uh, logic for it is exactly the same thing. You could have written the construct, the, 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 the move constructor separate from assignment, a move assignment, like you could do with copy constructor and copy assignment. But reusing code is always sweet. You have less work to do. So uh, did I make a mistake over here in this? In, uh, in calling them, in creating the move levies? No, no, it's perfect actually. <clears throat> yeah, move uh, doesn't, the, the good thing about moving is that you don't have to worry too much about uh, uh, checking to see if there is a data in the other one or not. You are simply moving whatever the other person had, the other object has. So for, even if it's garbage, you're gonna own the garbage, yes. Is auto even possible using the auto You can use auto anywhere. If you have to. 
Don't be lazy. Don't think that if the object is returning, like you have a function, a function is returning, uh, um, uh, let's say, student record, right? You say, oh, that's too long. I'm going to write auto. A problem is that poor Farda is going to debug your code three years after you, you've left the company, looks at the function, and it says it's returning auto. Now I have to go trace the code to see what the heck it's returning. So if you don't have to, don't. Okay, auto is when you, the, the object may return different types, therefore you want to have the proper type set based on the return value. Don't do it just because you're lazy. And I see many people are like doing integer i, then write auto j is equal to i, right int. I mean like, you know, um, yeah. Just, it, it, let me tell you, it, it's a very simple rule in programming. If you write something that Five minutes later, you have to think what you have right. Just imagine how others are going to react looking at your code. Easy. So, yes. Nine? Ninety-nine. So I'm saying I'm assigning M value, the one that I have right now to the one that is coming from here. That's assignment, right? M value belongs to me, and M value belongs to the one that I'm receiving. So I'm assigning the current one to the one that I'm assigning to. What's wrong with that? Current one is this, right? So if I say I'm assigning A to B, what is being assigned, what is being copied? A is being assigned, B is being copied, right? <laughs> So when I say assigning, assign m value to n dot m value, it means assign my data to the data that is coming in. So I kind of I can trace it when I'm actually debugging it. What's so you're talking about uh, the move assignment? In move assignment, <clears throat> and oh, no, see, one says to, the other one says into. Okay, you want me to change it? I can change it, sure. It's my bad, see? <laughs> Just, <clears throat> so, okay, you're absolutely right, see? Did you just notice what happened, right? Okay, I just lost consistency over there and I just uh, killed somebody's brain cells. So. So you're absolutely right. Instead of into, I'm going to right now assign to. Uh, and uh, thank you. That's consistency. That was perfect example for it. That's consistent. Just the, the debugging statement that I wrote was confusing even, right? So I think that makes more sense, though, right? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> nice. I have, I have a, a peer reviewer over here. When to use which one? Okay. Oh, it's pretty simple to actually explain. It's pretty simple to explain. <coughs> when the method, see, wh what is the purpose of encapsulation? Tell me. Encapsulation, OP244. As a whole body, and uh, uh, the, the app outside cannot reach it. So, privacy is one of them, right? Privacy is one of them, but privacy is a side effect of encapsulation. It's not the reason. Okay? You have a heart, I have a heart. If I run fast, my heart's going to go fast, not yours. That's the side effect of encapsulation, not because I. I needed that. So when we have, okay, encapsulation is to put the data and behavior of the same object together so they relate with each other. So when I run faster, your heart won't go faster. In real life, when I give that example, I say, are you crazy? Yeah, that's, that's because that's C, right? In C, you, 
you have to tell which heart is supposed to go fast. It wasn't encapsulated. Each person didn't have heart of its own. We had a human class, and the human class has a heart. Therefore, if that human runs, the heart goes faster. And automatically, each running accelerates the beating of the heart of that object. Are we clear on that? OK. So encapsulation is to put the data and behavior together. Now, if your function that you are writing is to manipulate the data of the current object to enforce privacy, not privacy, to enforce encapsulation so other class objects won't get affected, that's not static. OK? But if in a process of doing some action in your methods, you need to do some everyday things that is not specific to your class. Like, for example, if I have a class called name, and I have, uh, if I have a, a class called person, and a person has a name, and I have a function called introduce, right? Then introduce cannot be static because it has to introduce each object differently, correct? But if I have a function that is supposed to add a title to the name, Okay, which means I have a function called add title, and it's going to add title to the name. The process of adding the title is to increase the memory, concatenate one to another, right? This action has nothing to do with the name. It's some tool thingy that you are using. It's like you are using C string. It's like you are using another object to do your work in here. If you are writing a function like that, that does the dirty work of the other, functions not affecting the member variables, those are static. Again, if, for example, in this name thingy that I have, okay, if I did not have that C string in here, okay, and I want to do allocate and copy and everything only for the name, not for everything else, then this copy and length that I wanted to do to find out what is the length and name, it would have been a static method in the name because it's not specifically for the name. It's a general tool that you're using to make regular methods do their work. So they become just tools. So it makes sense that they are actions of a class that can be used in R objects. When that's the idea, that you have a specific type of action that is generalized to all the methods and not specifically to data of each, those are perfect candidates for static methods. And same thing, like, let, let, me sh let me show you something else. For example, let's put it this way. Is this the one with move constructor? Yes. So let's say I want to know how many names I have in my program? How many name objects were created in my program? Right? How can I do that? How can you know how many names you have? Like when somebody writes a program, how many instances of class name is created? How can you say? This has nothing to do with name. This is a general thing that applies to all names. Therefore, I'm going to write over here static int m number of objects. And because it's a static variable, I have to instantiate it outside. So I have to say actually, uh, I have to say int, uh, what is the thing? Name, right? Name. Why is this thing giving me an error in here? O stream is ambiguous? <clears throat> Meh, I don't know. We'll find out. Anyways, name, and in here I'm going to say number of objects, and I'm going to set that one to be zero. Okay? So now this static variable 
that is created over there gets initialized just by itself it, because it doesn't belong to any of the objects. I cannot initialize it in a constructor because which constructor, right? Now I want to have a method to show me how many objects are there, right? I can write a regular method over here saying number of objects, so I have something like int number of objects, okay, const, something like that, and I can simply return m number of objects, and in my constructor, not move constructor, because move constructor, actually move constructor is creating a new object too, the other one just is empty. Anyways, but so in a constructor over here, I'm going to say m number of objects plus plus, and in the destructor, I'm going to say, where is the destructor? I'm going to say m number of objects minus minus, right? From regular methods, I can access the static one. Are we okay down to this point? So now every constructor will add one to the number of objects, and because of the number of objects is a class variable, it's shared between all the names, therefore I can add to the value. Now the question is that, is this the correct logic, number of objects? The answer is no. Number of objects has nothing to do with functionality of name. The fact that I have 20 students in this class doesn't have to do anything with him. The action is not an action of a student. A student doesn't have number of students in it. Correct? Therefore, that's wrong. That should have been static too. And I don't need to make it constant anymore because there is no object to make it to change. It cannot change the object. So now it makes sense. I have a, I have a function and that function actually uh, uh, is a feature that is one of the necessities of name because with that I can find out how many names I have. But it's not an action of a name object. There, hence, becomes a class method. Does that answer the question? Well, I always forget to put these things. I move around like a monkey and I keep hitting stuff, so I cannot stand still. Anyway, so uh, yeah. So in here, I'm gonna, uh, just, to remind, just, rem just to remember what we talked about, I'm gonna call over here and say, why static method? Static method. So we can remember what we did, okay? Of, of course, in your program, in here, if you want to know how many names you have, you can simply say C out. Uh, we have, now in here you say, you don't say, you could, I have to give it time for it to actually, okay, there you go. All right. We could say a number of objects and print that out because it, a, a, an object always have access to its static methods, but we shouldn't do that. It's better to actually say over here, name, scope resolution name of objects. And you have been using that for a long time. Remember like in C in and C out, you left justified, you do iOS scope resolution stuff. Those are stuff that are not specifically uh, related to one thing. It, it affects everything because of that. They are, they are, they are, they are classified. So this, uh, we have something, I'm going to say names in this program. Are we good? Okay. All right. Yes. Oh, uh, did I open it? Should I open it again? One more time? Sorry, you mentioned when you go static, right? Mm -hmm. So what if by mistake you have like a if it's one instance like You can. It won't allow you. You can from with a static from a static method you cannot change anything in the class. It belongs to the class, not the object. You cannot change any regular properties. You cannot change any properties. Okay? All right. Question? All right. All right, so 
Next things. So I have I had uh, different uh, examples for rule of five that when things are called in different types of. What did I do? So for example, in here, as you see, move is called specifically for every single thing that we have we have run and it's gonna call the move constructor because of that. So walk through these things one by one just to remember how things are done. Move.cpp. And then I have another example over here for uh, uh, rule of five that is, as you see, there is a function called get name, and get name is returning an n by value. When anything is passed by value, you know it's going to get copied into a nameless object and returned to the caller function, correct? Therefore, that nameless variable dies. Because of that, in these cases, you don't need to say move. Because what get name is returning is about to die, it will be moved automatically using the move constructor. And that makes your program faster. You do that in OOP 244, it still works flawlessly. But the difference is that when name actually received is, a name is received in the get name function, and that name actually is set, and then it's returned, you have one name created in uh, name, in, in get name that is gonna get created and die, and then it's gonna get copied to a nameless that is gonna get created and die, and then that nameless has to get copied again into the one you are assigning it to that is C or assigned to it, and then that nameless has to die. So that's lots of procedure. So essentially by doing something like this, you're gonna say, okay, because, sorry, in here, in here, you're gonna say, okay, this is a nameless object, so I'm not gonna bother, because it's gonna die, right? I'm just gonna take its data and say, you go away, okay? And the, the dead thing is gonna go away and I'm gonna keep its data, therefore it's moved, therefore that uh, extra step of creating an object, copying it, and then twice actually, and then killing it will go away and your program runs approximately twice as, twice as fast at that moment. Are we good? You're talking about N? N, yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah, because it's in a function, this is, has a function scope, it's gonna die over here. And because it's gonna die, it has to get copied before it's returned. But uh, for 130, 139, yes. Uh, it's because it returns, uh, A is only created in the Yeah, A is not gonna die. It's just an assignment. I want to force C to, to get whatever is in A and A becomes property less after that. It's as if I'm moving the property from one uh, <coughs> individual to another. It's exactly as if I give you my cell phone. You get it from me, so my property is moved to you. That's what move, move assignment and move constructor does. It's a beautiful thing, actually. Are we good? Okay, I think we still have to have a couple of more labs as lecture, because we are still in previous session. And that's one of the differences between an online and in-person thing. In online people, for some reason, people think that the microphone is gonna bite their lip. They don't, they don't, activate the microphone and talk. You just sit over there. Probably you're not even there. I don't know. But any, anyways. So that's yet another move. So C move.cpp. So take a look at all different versions of move and see what you would need. Any questions? I'm going to wipe this out and start a new talk. Yeah. Sorry, I'm gonna get closer. I do not understand what you're saying. Go. Oh, so in the C two thousand and four that had the move operators, mm -hmm. when you um, force the move on the nameless and so the nameless is invalid before. Let me bring it up. Let me bring it up. That's better to actually look at it when you're asking the question. So 
line number? One thirty. One forty. Yeah, this is gonna uh, print an empty string. Yeah. So it, over here, is, essentially, it's gonna say nothing. It's a null string. Nothing to it. Uh, I encourage you to please load this in Visual Studio. Keep pressing F10 and F11. Go through it. Turn that tracer off with F11. Walk through it. Guess where it's gonna go. See if you are right. Okay. That's a beautiful tool for you to teach you how things work. Debug, F11 step into, F10 step over. If I do step over, I'm not gonna see what happens. It's gonna jump from one to another. But if I put F11 over here, it actually goes to the copy constructor. I think I've done that 50,000 times in class, didn't I? Every single time I run it, it's that way. So first I'm pressing F10, it's gonna compile and run. Have you ever clicked on these things? Be a little adventurous when you are using, look at the menus, oh, debug, let me click and see, what does it do? Do it, anyways, F10, okay. Now I'm pressing F10 again. Now tracer, and, and we can actually resize the window too, in case, uh, and now I put it over here, and we turn it to right so we can see over here at right. Now tracer is true, so it's gonna actually show me what happened. So when I press F10, over here, if I press F10, the constructor is happened, it's not gonna go in there as one shot, you see? It shows everything, and then goes over here, and Tracer is gonna do another one. Now if I press F10 again, it's gonna see in, wait for me over here to, uh, oh, it's actually getting something? Okay, far that. Okay, I hit enter, and now I'm pressing F10 again. I'm actually, I'm gonna put F11 over here to see that it actually goes to the operator and I press F11 again, it goes to print and so I can see how everything happens. And now if I come over here, I press F10, it moves it, magically goes through it and I'll go to the rest. But here if I press F11, it actually goes inside and shows what happens, okay? All right. Please do it at home. Not that I don't wanna do it, if it's a new concept, that's how I teach, but uh, all those, so the magic that you thought says trace, I didn't do that. I actually press F2 and F. Anyways. All right. So any questions? Don't be shy, you can still pause me, I don't mind. I have several labs that I can lecture in it. <laughs> Nothing? All right. So, let's uh, start a new thing that we kind of started in OP244. Save. We good? I think we're good, right? I think we're good. Uh, anybody remembers what templates were? Anybody can tell me, like, like in a very short form, the what what is template? What is it good for? Should I choose my victim, or are you gonna talk? No one's gonna talk. You talked enough. Don't talk. <laughs> Anyone? And you too. We talked enough. No one else. All those people who are. Like talkative, I don't want them to die. I want the shy ones who I never see them. What is a template? And you can always say pass if you don't want to talk. Okay, beautiful. It's an inclusive thing, okay. It's one of the features of polymorphism. It means it can have many shapes. What else? It works for different types of data, hence polymorphism. And it passes. <laughs> it 
Yeah, same thing. So we, essentially we are saying it can have different types. We can have, so let's just talk about templates for two seconds. So if I have a function template, okay, foo. It's a template foo thingy. It, it's a template for whatever, we don't care, okay? No, 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 no. Backtrack, backtrack, backtrack. I have a regular function called foo. Okay, so I have a regular function called foo. Then I write 50 other functions, foo1, foo2, foo3, and I keep going like that. There's regular functions. When I compile this, the source of all these things is gonna be in my executable, right? So literally, if I actually open the binary code, I can actually see my, the name of my functions here or there in my application, in the executable, if I hack it. So when you write a function, it is within your code, and okay. Now, let's say I have a template function called foo, okay? And I have a main, but I have no use for it. So I'm not gonna call the template fun, the function, okay? When I compile the code, where is the source code of that template in my executable? Is it at all? The answer is? It's not there. Templates code are generated by compiler. So if you don't use a template, no function will be even created for you. Not, but if you call that foo in three different ways with three different files, then you're gonna have three functions created in your executable. So essentially, template is asking the compiler to rewrite the function for you based on your function call types. Do we understand this? You have to appreciate the fact that templates don't exist in your source code until you call them. Compiler has to write it for you successfully and then you're gonna have it. Are we good with this? All right, so we just a review of what templates were and why it's good, because you are writing five different functions and overloading a function and over and over is gonna bloat your executable, right? In case you want to use one of them, I'm gonna write 50 different version, versions of my function and keep overloading. That, that's why we call that fake polymorphism. What kind of, a, uh, what, what was it called? What is, a, what is, what is, po what is overloading? Which, ca which, which category it falls into? Ad hoc, right? It's, it's, I call it fake polymorphism. Overloading is not polymorphism. Compiler just behind the scene names it differently. So if you have a foo and an integer, it calls it foo int. If you have a foo and an, an accept an argument character, it's called it foo char. There are two different functions. They don't have the same name. Parametric one, which is template, which means it's going to take the shape of whatever you do at compile time and it's efficient to the bone because you only will have the code for what you need and not a single line more. That is why templates are awesome. And that is what, anybody remember that old commercial, I think it was for Apple, that he used to say like, you want to do this, there's an app for that. Remember that? In C++, you want to do this, there's a template for that. Anything you want to do in C++, in any area, area or whatever, you have a standard temporary library for that. Like you want to do data structures and do a graph and do a binary search in a balanced tree, template for that. So it makes your life easy if you learn how to use them. And it's, they're not as easy. And because the types keep changing, that's where auto comes in handy because Sometimes the templates are returning some kind of a thing that you have no idea what it is. But you need to use it, so that's your best when you do auto. Don't use auto. Maybe you don't need it. All right, are we good? So now we know templates. Let's start coding baby steps, going through and see how templates and everything are done. So uh, templates are implemented in two different ways. When you're writing a template, you can actually write uh, the, the old-fashioned way or the new way. The old-fashioned way says, I have a template class T, for, so class essentially, the type is the one that is gonna be changed, and the function 
uh, receives a type by value over here, and it's going to show that value, right? That's the, that's the template that we have. So you do it like that, or you can do it a new way, actually write type name over here. So class, type name, potatoes, potatoes, same. One important thing that you need to do for templates is documentation. One important thing that you need to do for templates is documentation. Now when you see template number one, what documentation, this is OP244, just trying to remember. And we have to remember this before we go into the thing. So what kind of documentation I have to have? What should I say in the comment of that far TA? Anyone? Actually, I came right down to here. My automatic friend. What should be the feature? What should be the feature? Don't be sorry to answer the question. <laughs> What should be the feature? Like, what should I, what, what document, what the user, because when the user looks at that, it only sees a fa. Yeah, so, uh, so you should say? No, actually, yeah, it's sure, sure, printing input. But in which cases that template cannot work, would yeah. fail to work? Um, it's, uh, uh, no, it works perfectly for objects. Let's pass. Do you remember? Sorry. Hmm? Uh, if it's what? Mm, it, that doesn't implement an array. Who's going to pass an array for a single argument? No. What do you remember at all? So maybe I'm not passing it for. So uh, I'm, I'm going to. Okay, let's try. Go ahead. Say it in OP345 language. It must follow rule of. Five, we just learned five. We just learned five, okay? It has to, it has to follow rule of five. Otherwise it won't work, right? I said, say OOP three, four, five, and she said rule of three. I'm like, what? But we just learned rule of five. Okay, so, so that's why, so that has to, that has to follow rule of five. Otherwise it may have memory leak. So we're gonna say this function does yada yada print stand, huh? And the type of this thing, the type of the template must follow rule of five. We okay with this? All right. And how about this one? The second one. What does the second one need to have? Oh, <laughs> I thought you were, I did. We <laughs> so, go, you want to answer? No, no, it, it has to be double, you're on the right track, but th that's kindergarten version of saying it. Uh, we, we, I, want, I, want, I want a pro answer for it. <laughs> Pass, milady. Sir. You too. Huh? <laughs> what features T must have? No, nope, not at all. Doesn't need copy constraint at all. No. Zero, no need. Seriously, what do you see over there? It should be a? Dabber or float? No. It should be a? No. No. Well, keep, keep, keep naming all the types. Maybe one of them has got to come true. Go ahead. Huh? Basic type? No. Seriously. OOP, how did you guys pass it OP244 again? Seriously. Beautiful, that's one, thank you. So it must work with the extraction operator and O string, but we forgot to mention to the other one. So that's rule number one. It must work with extraction operator. Number two. How can it be an L value? She, he's a, how can you make an object an L value? By overloading 
the assignment operator and a double. That object should work with assignment operator and a double. It should accept a double as an assignment operator. How? We don't care. And the third one, the most important one. What operator? Is there such an operator? We just invented a new operator, instruction operator. It instructs you. No. Default constructor. Default constructor. I just created an object with nothing. Shame. Shame. Back to 244, all of you. Okay. So those are so I have to document it. Okay. So this is a good review, actually. We are we are waking up. Okay, we are waking up. Uh, what's the time? Now we need two more labs. <laughs> for lecturing, it's 2.40, what time does, it, does the class end? 25? 1.25. 25. Um, I don't know about you, but I need to have a glass of water. So uh, let's pause. So that's uh, the start of templates. Actually, function templates. So function templates can be written in many different ways as long as the compiler is capable of following the, uh, generating the code for you based on the types that you're calling with, you can actually <coughs> create a template any way you want. So for example, I create a, a, a function co called swap over here. I want to swap the value of two things. So with this function template, I'm receiving two references, and uh, uh, I'm replacing the value of the two. And now I can use this for any uh, class to swap, anything to swap. I can swap anything I want in here, and they're gonna be all working properly. And <clears throat> this, uh, now, what do we need? Specifications, what, what does that template need? The things it needs. What are the things it needs? You remember? Nope. Class. First one is is exactly like the previous one. Remember? What does this one need? The swap. <laughs> you see, I have a swap over there. You see that? It swaps the value of two things. So I'm creating a temporary, temporary type. They are, then I'm using that temporary type to swap the value of the two arguments that I reference. So what does that function need? Yeah, I mean like if I want to document it, I should say the type should support what? You remember? Kill me now. Yes, numero uno. No. Yes, correct, default constructor. The first thing is default constructor. So default constructor is the first thing it needs. Numero dos. Second one. Pardon me? Copy assignment. Yes, copy assignment. Can it be move assignment? No, because I'm swapping. If I'm swapping and it moves, I'm screwed. I don't want to do that, right? I want to swap. So two things it needs to do. It needs to have copy construction. It needs to be able to be def default constructor, first thing. The second thing would be to uh, uh, work with assignment operator. Copy assignment, as we say, all right? And it's going to work. Please walk through this. F10 and 11. <laughs> I'm not going to let you go. <laughs> See, I uh, like stand up comedians that they pinpoint some poor person in the audience and they just pick on the person to make everybody laugh. Sometimes I do that. My apologies. <laughs> it's just to. to get the, but what you teach in C++, it's so dry and boring that I need to jump up and down and act like a clown so, so we can go somewhere. So uh, I uh, apologize for that. So that's how uh, templates are written. We know that syntax for it. 
The next thing we need to know that is extremely important is a specialization. Now, what specialization is in templates is essentially the fact that when you are writing a template, although you are writing a template to take care of certain things, but sometimes that template of yours just doesn't work with some types. And for that purpose, you have to change and write new code for it. So your template, instead of only having one code, needs to have like three code, three different versions to cover everything. So what you do, first you create your uh, uh, template. So, so first you create your template. Pardon me? I'm overwriting? Oh, the old one? Oh, yeah, you're right. No, don't save. I need that. Thank you. All right. So, whoa. All right. So, if I write a template to find the maximum value between two things, I have to write that. I want to write that, okay? But if I write that, it first of all, it has to have copy construction because it's passing values, passing things by value. That's number one. I could have made it a reference and my life would have been easier. No, because I want to copy. So I could, yeah, it, it, because I'm returning something over there by value, then copy constructor is needed anyway, so I'm not going to bother. Of course, it is more efficient. I'm just trying to see if I make these two reference, will it be more efficient? Let me teach. Forget it. Okay, so it needs copy construction, and I'm just and it compares the two, and returns the the, the, the highest value between the two. Correct. So having something like this, well, the, what this template needs, it needs uh, copy construction, and it needs greater than operator to be able to compare the two and return true if one is bigger than the other one. If my uh, program satisfies those, uh, those things, then uh, uh, I need, uh, I, uh, um, I'm okay. But let's say I have a class employee, okay? And that employee class of mine, I need to compare the two based on their salary. And that's not how great, uh, I mean, even the greater than operator is not defined in an employee. If that's the case, so if, if let's say I had a class, I'm not gonna go into detail of it, but let's say I have a class employee, and that class employee of mine has some stuff that dictates which one is maximum, which one is, bigger than the other one, maybe seniority, maybe we, we, we wanna see which one has, has uh, more experience than the other one. I want to find the maximum experience between two employees. If I want to do that, then this is not gonna work because the, the greater than sign over here does not work with the employee. If that's the case, then what I need to do is to create a template like this. So I'll create template And I'm not going to put anything in here. That says this is specialization. It tells the compiler I am specializing another uh, te function template. And it can recognize which one is it with its name. So the name over here will be maximum, okay? But what it returns may be an employee pointer. And what it receives. What it receives, yeah, what it receives uh, uh, will be something like employee pointer A and employee pointer B. Now, to actually tell, identify this thing that this thing is actually specialization, I have to put the type I want to be the type of the uh, uh, the function right in front of the name. So in here, it's gonna be employee like that. So I, and then in here, I can actually do whatever is needed. So 
um, do whatever needed, and then return the proper employee that I have, return whatever. So I don't know, uh, A or B or whatever, Re return A or B, whatever. Okay, yes. One more time. To overload the operator and the employee. But employee is a, a class that is written with the HR department. You don't have access to their source code. You're not allowed to change their source code. Think bigger than a student writing an assignment. To be able to modify a source code, you have to file a request, re request justify it, goes through the team of an analyst. Three years later, they're going to tell you, go, I don't want to do it. It cannot just change something. Remember that. Okay, when you are working in a real world and you have an application that you are working and you are supposed to do something with that employee that does something for you, 99.9% .9 of the time, the employee is not written by you. It's some open source thinking that is written by Mozilla. Right? You have access to its definition, you know what an employee can do, but that's the extent of it. Okay? Beautiful question. So yeah, so now you can apply whatever you want to do to this, to this one, and this becomes your specialization. <clears throat> or for example, uh, yeah, if I wanted to have, uh, for example, testing done between two strings, which one is bigger? C strings. I want to compare two C strings and return the one that is bigger with respect to dictionary values. If I want to do that, then uh, the solution would be something like this. Again, template, I'm going to say it's constant character pointer because that's the C string. Obviously, it's a constant character pointer. And I'm going to say uh, receive to constant character pointer. And string compare of A and B should be greater than 0. Then A is returned, otherwise B. So again, based on what is needed, I add different types of definitions to the template. And again, these ones are not written, the code are not written, unless they are actually used. If nobody compares two, string, two C strings to see which one is maximum, then, uh, and these things are needed. I had a question like, could I just overload the, the uh, less than operator for the constant character, for constant character pointer? Uh, the answer is, is no, because uh, you, cannot, you can overload uh, uh, an operator. But if our op operator already exists between two values, we cannot change its meaning. So I cannot say now the less than sign between two integers from now is greater than sign. You can't do that. You can redefine less than operator for two objects who, who cannot work for that op with that operator, but you cannot change the meaning. Okay, therefore these are needed. Uh, this, yeah. this tells that this maximum is a specialization for this type. Otherwise, how does it know what it is? What is the type? Right? It needs to know what specialization is for. And you can, you can uh, l literally, uh, like it does, as you know, if you, if you didn't implement this, this would have worked with no, not worked, this wouldn't, wouldn't have give you any compiler using a constant character pointer. But the result would be which one has bigger address in memory. That would have been. So that's why you can redefine just to, uh, uh, put an emphasis on it, that specialization could be for anything that you think it's needed, even for integers if you want to. So for this one, if somebody wants to use maximum between two integers, this is going to get called. Whatever. Yes? The answer is, I have no idea. I have never done that before. I've never, I don't know. Because it's, it's a free format language, I presume even if you do, because this works, I know that. So if that works, 
then that should work too. But who, I've, I've, I've never put a space. Why do I put a space? <laughs> Interesting question. I don't know if this works or not. I don't know. Try it and let us know. <laughs> All right? So that's specialization. So anytime you want to specialize, um, um, uh, a function template, that's how you do it. Yes? The integer? Just to tell you, it doesn't, sometimes you want a template to work differently for a type for no particular reason. It doesn't mean that you can't because it works for it. You know what I mean? Like you, like you would say, like I want, I want it to be for for integers. If it is zero, I wanted this this to happen. So you want to make some changes for it. That example was actually stupid <laughs> because it does the exact same thing, and I specialized it. But I just put a message over there showing that specialization would be called just to show you that if you write an integer, that's going to be the case. But uh, there is no there is no reason for it. Why do we need it? I'm going to say no need for this at all. Just th this is just for example. And there is no need for it. OK? Another thing that we have to always remember is the fact that overloading, so if you have an overloaded function doing the same thing your specialization is supposed to do, compiler will always choose the overloading. OK? So you can overload your template. So why specialize? Can anybody answer? You have the knowledge for it based on what I said today. Why do I need to specialize when I can overload? That's easier. Thank you. Because if you overload, the code is going to be in your program. It's a function. The whole purpose of the template, not to add the code in your source code. Thank you. 1% for midterm. All right? So <clears throat> remember that. This is important, OK? So. Special, and this is the first time that actually somebody answered that in, in three, four, five. Anybody's blank. Today somebody answered. I'm a happy man. All right. Yeah. So yeah. So if you so for for here, if you if you write both of them, <laughs> compiler literally says when you do something like the compiler wants to create it. Says, Wait a minute. <laughs> it's already here. Why do I need to create it? Right. So it doesn't. Remember that. So if the function already exists, compiler won't overwrite it. It just ignores it, ignores your, your, my, your specialization. So if there is a specialization for something and you want to overwrite that specialization to do your own thing, you can always overload it. OK, so that's something good to know. All right. Overload. I want to say overwrite, but then it's going to overload uh, comes first. So overload comes first. Remember that. Yes. You have a very delicate voice, my friend, and my ear is not. <laughs> Overloaded always has priority to specialization. Compi compiler will not specialize it because you overloaded it. So if your overloading has a code that is not like your specialization, your overload is going to be used, not the specialization. Am I making sense? Because sometimes you, you, you don't need to. I'm just letting you know that if you by mistake have an overload of a template, your specialization for that template, or even the template, will not work. Oh, no, 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 no. 
So that so it's not overloading the specialization. Overloading has priority to template. So if that swap, if that's a, if that maximum thing that I have written, if I write an overload for an integer, if an integer call is made for the template, it's not going to get created. It chooses the overload. Okay? So overload blocks the template of getting created for that signature, always. Okay? Good questions coming up. I like it. I like it. Uh, next. Where's my mouse? Oh, there we go. Next thing is to, if your, if your template is not being generated the way you want, and or there is some kind of a conflict that the compiler cannot resolve it. So when you are actually calling a template, compiler looks at it and says, I can make this in two different ways. So I'm not going to create it for you. I'm going to give you an error. If that's the case, how to force the compiler to pick one over the other, to actually generate a, a code of a t of, out of a template the way you want it to? This is how it's done. So now we have this maximum thing over here, and I have a double and a float. Some compilers cannot distinguish between the two because, like, believe me, in old times, an integer and a character and a short could not be overloaded because all integer passing through arguments would, ha would have been upcasted to an int. That was how the compiler was designed. So you could not overload uh, uh, a function to receive a long and an int and a short and a character and based on call, different ones are called. Wouldn't work. Okay, now if you have such a case, let's say our compiler cannot distinguish between a double and uh, a float, so it doesn't know which one to call. And when you look at it, in here I'm passing a double, and for the second one I'm passing a float. So it doesn't know which one is what. I want my float to be upcasted to a double for that template. So I explicitly asked the compiler to create the maximum with a double signature as a template and call it with that. So compiler now creates that one and calls this one. This call will be directed to that one. And I can do the exact same thing with the other one. So I have a float and I'm doing a float between a double so it downcasts. Probably you've got to get a warning over there telling, hey, what are you doing? You're, you're, you might lose data. But it's going to do it. So you can force the compiler to create a specific type of template for you by adding the signature to the function template. Okay? So that's, uh, well, essentially you can resolve a conflict. So resolve template calls manually. So you add the signature to it. Lots of information, right? And we are just on function templates. We haven't even started class templates yet. One more time. Uh huh. Yeah, it won't work. It's, if you if it so, what happens is that say you have a function template that is using default constructor. You pass an object that doesn't have a default constructor. So first it will generate the code for you, then the compiler is going to tell you no uh, proper default constructor is this yada yada. So you know that, oops, that, does, that didn't work. It's not going to just call it and crash. It won't compile. Because 
always remember, templates are actually functions that are generated. So after they are generated, compiler actually checks to see if the call is possible. So it uses your request to generate it, then tries to actually call it to see if you fail or not. I'm trying to see how to approach the, the class template. Let me do it this way this time. You know what I'm going to do? Yeah, this is good. So let's create a class over here. So I'm just going to take these off. Save it. Now I'm going to create a class over here. And let's call that class. I have done this in OOP244, so that this is already done in OOP244. And since you all mastered it perfectly, you know exactly how it works. So this is a, uh, uh, um, uh, an integer array class that holds, simulates uh, an integer array uh, using an object. So that's the, uh, the header file, and this is the CPP file. I'll quickly explain how it works. I'm just, I'm just going to actually compile it, make sure everything's OK. So let me just compile this. Compile, compile. If it gives me, no, nah, no errors, good. OK, so I have created, um, like to, to explain how dynamic memory allocation works, we created a dynamic integer last semester. We said to uh, overcome the problem with the var with, with arrays in C where you don't know what their size is, you can pass its size and crash, and uh, you cannot resize a, a thing. Uh, if you want to do that, you have to do dynamic memory. It takes a long time. So what if we just, if I want an array, why don't I just create an integer array that is dynamic? And we said that class integer array of mine obviously creates an array, and to create the array, it needs a pointer to point to it, and that's the data that it's going to point to the array. Obviously, unlike regular uh, C arrays, it knows what is its size, so it keeps the value for the size somewhere, which I would like to change this to size t. And because of this, I'm going to get five and a half million errors, and I'm going to fix it as we are going through. So size t is essentially a type that is, is uh, uh, in C++ to keep size, size of something, and resize it to new size. And you can actually create an array with a specific size. I wanted to say we change. Let's not do that. I'll do it afterwards. Let's not confuse you with that. I'll do it afterwards. Because uh, it's uh, OP244, right? We didn't have size, size T over there now. So anything that is size, I'm going to change it to anything relative to size, I'm going to change it to size t. Okay? So it's going to have the size. I can resize the array using a private method that resizes the array. I'll give it new size. Automatically it resizes, copies the old values and everything. And I can initially create the array with a size. And funny thing is that in here I didn't specify what. And if you don't mention it, I'm going to give it 100. Okay? So it's going to be 100. Uh, Integers, or I'll make it one. <laughs> Conflicted brain, isn't it? Hundred, and then I made it one. So I'm going to make it one and see what happens. It means an array with one element. Now, if you recite, as you go through it, it's going to grow bigger and bigger. I have a copy constructor. I have a copy assignment. I do not have a move constructor. I do not have a uh, uh, move assignment. So. Uh, probably it's a good idea to do it as practice. It's very simple, actually. Um, I, if, uh, if I have time, I'll do it. Other, otherwise, I want you to do it, OK? It tells what, it is, what the size of the array is. 
so you can actually see what the size of your array is. You can access each index exactly like a regular array because the index operator is overloaded in two different ways. Either you can, uh, you can change the values or it's constant. So it will work however you use it. If you pass the element as a, as a constant value, the constant one will be called because it's polymorphic, and if not, the other one. I have a destructor, obviously, to destroy, and mm, I am sure that virtual would be nice over here. Virtual, we mentioned that from the day you learn what virtual is all to the moment you die, all your destructors are virtual no matter what, okay? Even if you do not plan to inherit anything, make them virtual. That guarantees that if inheritance happens, leak is not gonna happen, okay? And then I'm gonna uh, display the uh, the array using a display method and obviously overload the insertion operator and therefore an array can be displayed as a whole. It's going to print everything out, which a regular array in C language, you have to write a loop for it. Okay? Um, any question with this? And how it works, how actually this integer array works, um, uh, quickly I go through it. Uh, if the size is equal to zero or negative, it's gonna make it one. Um, um, it uh, allocates the value, sets the size to whatever size it is. If you are copying it, it creates the exact same amount, and then afterwards it's gonna copy every single individual to the other one. When you assign it, it makes sure that it's not self-copy, deletes the current one, allocates enough to the size of the other one, copies all the data, returns the reference of the current one, uh, it deletes the data when it's gone. Size tells you what is the size. Operator index checks to see if the index is less than zero, it makes it zero. If the index is greater than size, it resizes it. So no matter what you do, it's never gonna go off. It just makes it bigger, okay? And the uh, constant one, because it's not supposed to change the owner, if the index is less than zero, it makes it zero. If it passes it, it simply loops back to the beginning. So if you try to get out with the constant one, it simply turns you back. So you just screw up your own memory, no, no one else's. Okay, that's, the, that's what the mod is doing over there. Display goes through every single uh, element of the operator one by one and uh, displays them. So I called it in two different ways so you know both of them can be used. So first it shows the first one and then it keeps going like that. Resize resizes by creating a new size, copying everything from one to another. So this one actually can make it smaller too, although we never use it, use it that way. Copies everything into the copy one, sets the new size, delete the old data, points to the new data, and displays it, and we have an integer array that is dynamic. I don't want to wake him up. Anyway, so uh, are we okay down to this point? This is just for integers, so it sucks. I want this thing to be for everything. I want this to be for anything. I don't want to just have integer array. If I want to do something like that, what I need to do is to convert this to a template. So anybody wants to create any type of array can create it. So it can create integer, whatever it wants to create. To do something like that, I have to follow rule number one which is all the code for a, for a template should reside inside which file? Header file. Everything th about a template should be in a header file. Therefore, I'll do that. I'm going to create a header file over here. Uh, <clears throat> new item. It's going to be a header file. Let's call it dynamic. Okay, dynamic array.h. Okay, probably it's gonna give me pragma once. I don't want it. I'm gonna say if not define SDDS dynamic array. Pardon me? Uh, nothing's wrong with it. It's just not backwards compatible. Okay, there are compilers that don't understand what pragma once is. They are obsolete now, but you never know. So, uh, and like this, we understand what we learn and practice preprocessor directives. So do it to get used to it. 
But you're absolutely right, no difference. That's why we have them both. If you actually go to the header files, you will see they put them both. The header files, the system header files. If you go to standard input output header files, you see it says pragma once and then writes the, <laughs> the safeguard. Okay, so uh, namespace, SDDS. And now what I will do, I will copy everything that I have in here and put it right there. So that's the class definition, comes over here, goes to the dynamic thingy. And then I'm gonna have the integer array, everything in here copied and goes right at the bottom over here. What did I do? I copied something extra, I think. And the other one, I think I have two namespaces now. I'm not a good copier, never was. Okay, so uh, we don't need these. All right, let's bring everything down. All right, and you can always format your, uh, uh, you can always format your, uh, uh, what you may call it, the, uh, the uh, class using control K, control D. Uh, oh, oh, I don't have the thing over here. So in here, I'm gonna say include IOS. No, 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 no. Bad boy, I am. There we go. Include IO stream because I'm using it. I cannot use using anymore because I'm in a header file. Using namespace STD cannot be used. And luckily, I have all the STDs over there. Do I have the other ones over here too? If I don't, then I'll put it. Anyways, we'll find out. It's gonna give us an error if, if it's not there. So, so done, so I'll save it, okay? Now I have to start converting this to a template. Now, how a class template works. So let's over here add our dynamic thingy. So I'm gonna say include dynamic array.h. We are adding that one over here to use. If you want to instantiate that dynamic array, what do you need to do? And by the way, I have to do something else over here. This is supposed to be dynamic array, right? So I'm gonna come over here, you do like this, control H, and I'm gonna say change all int array in the current document to dynamic array. Whoosh, it's changed, okay? What? Seriously? What was that? They had, it's buggy. 2022 is buggy, people. Uh, Visual Studio 2022 is really buggy. Okay. Anyways, so, uh, so it all changed uh, to uh, dynamic string, so I'm gonna include that one. So if I want to create a dynamic string, I have to say dynamic, uh, so dynamic array. And in here, I'm gonna say A. Now, if I want to do something like this, like a function, a class does not have a signature. A function, you call the function from the signature, it knows which template to create, correct? Which specialization to choose. Are we okay with this? Okay, now, if we had a conflict, how did we fix the template thingy? We added the signature to the name of the function, correct? Because a class doesn't have the name, any signature, you always have to add that thing to the name. So if I want this dynamic array to be a dynamic array of doubles, I have to write over here, double. You cannot create a class template without a signature. Now that I have done this, I have to go and actually convert it to a temp template because it's not a template now, it's just a class. So in here, first of all, I'm gonna remove these two. And in here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I want this to be a template. I know that a template always, type name, uh, T, or type, okay? I know that it only affects the scope that is coming after. So it's gonna start from here to here. Now these are the rules you have to follow to actually create a template. First, you have to change all the types of interest into the template type, all of them. So that's the very first thing. What is the key it has to change? So 
I want this to be an array of everything. What over here is the major type that is the array? It's the M data, correct? So that has to be type. And in here, do I need to change this? No, it's size. It has nothing to do with that. Size, nothing, nothing, size. This one is, it's returning the value. Index is not, but it's returning the type. Whatever it is, it has to return that, correct? And this one is integer. I'm going to return that, set that. And this one it remains the same. Display does everything, and it comes over here. So that's number one. So first, you have to change all the types you want to convert to a template. Number two is to add the tag of template to all the class names, because we know now this is a template. Because it's a template, the tag must always attach the name. Otherwise, the compiler know, doesn't know which template you're dealing with, as we did it in this program over here. So we add a double A over here, and that's what happened. So number two, this is what I need to do. I need to add the tag of template type to all the class name, except there are exceptions. The name of the class that right, comes right after will not get it. You should not add to it, OK? All the names of constructor definitions should not get it and the destructor. Other than that, anywhere you see dynamic type, you have to change it. So this doesn't get it. This is name of the constructor, doesn't get it. Name of the constructor doesn't get it. This one is a type. So it has to receive the thing, type. This one is an operator equal. It's not constructor. It has to receive it. This is being copied. It has to receive it. In here, we don't need anything. In here, this is the destructor. Nothing's going to happen. Done. So now, your, your uh, class definition is converted to a template. You follow the exact same thing to every single individual scope that you have. So in here, I have a function template that deals with dynamic array. I have to change it to a template, even if it doesn't have a body, because it's the, pr it's the prototype. And in here, I have a dynamic array. That has to receive type. Whoa-oh. That has to receive type. And you keep going for every single scope. So this one must have the same thing. And you add it to wherever it goes, going out. The rest. Do it yourself. We'll, fi we'll find out uh, the rest of it afterwards. Let's go. I have to leave. The other class is coming in. I'm not going to change it. I'm going to continue it as a challenge. Try to do it yourself and see if you can actually make it work. Pardon me? Read this, the, the announcement. Friday. Friday is going to be open for a day.